After we did the moving up to amateur radio film for C. Beers, I got back to producing television shows that paid a real salary. Five years or so went by before the ARRL wanted another film, because by then the three previous ones were looking a bit like serious antiques. So much was happening, so fast. Tiny little handhelds, some of them as small as this one, were becoming the radio of choice for a lot of hams. Computers were replacing the old Model 15 teletype machines. The winds of change were whipping through our hobby. So in 1979, on a minuscule budget, we whipped up the world of amateur radio. You won't have to look very closely to see some very familiar scenes in this next one. But if you have never seen this show before, you're in for some surprises. After you've watched it, stay tuned for some behind-the-scenes info on the making of the world of amateur radio. WA6RNG, this is K6DUE. Byron, still on frequency? K6DUE, this is WA6RNG, Walking Mobile. Uh, right, uh, Roy, I'm still here. Uh, uh, how have you been? Oh, just fine, thanks. What are you up to? I'm taking my constitutional with Betty. Where are you? You'll never believe it. I'm in Long Beach, aboard the Queen Mary. Seemed like a good day to take the tour. Break. Go ahead, Breaker. Yeah, WA6RNG. This is WA6DAW, Mobile 6. Byron, are you the guy who recorded those radio announcements? The ones described in ham radio. I'm the guy. Well, I heard two of them last week. They're terrific. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, they've been getting quite a bit of play around the country. WA6RNG, W6PJX. Boyne, how are you? Fine, Byron. Hi, Renee. Hi, Roy. Right, please. That's my better half, guys. What you have here is a typical example of a bunch of friends and acquaintances hamming it up. Bernie, is there anything you'd like me to stop for on the way home? These are hands, amateur radio operators. Bernie Abramson is a director of cinematography. His wife, Patty, works for an airline. Bernie Tidwell is an engineer. Roy Neal is, of course, NBC science editor. And Byron Paul is Dick Van Dyke's partner, which explains how I got involved in a show about ham radio. I've been over at Byron's a lot, and he's usually here in the shack, as he calls it, fooling around with his rig, talking to one of his friends. He's got him all over the world. He's really into this hobby. That looks like fun to me, too. You never know who you're going to hear on this thing. Okay, John, thank you very much for a nice QSO. See you I later. you, boy. W6RTM, this is W6RO, K6DUE operating. 73. You know, amateur radio is the world's most fascinating hobby. To me, as a science reporter, I try to keep up with the developments in modern technology. But nothing gives me more of a thrill than the achievements of amateur radio. There are ham stations almost everywhere. For example, this one, aboard the Queen Mary, manned daily by members of the Long Beach Amateur Radio Club, for the benefit of tourists and visiting hams, like me. They even have a museum right next door, filled with radio memorabilia from the ship and from the early days of ham radio. It's hard to believe, but radio is less than 100 years old. It was 1896 when Marconi sent his first messages by wireless. Soon after, imaginative pioneers had built one-tube receivers that could hear signals in those supposedly worthless frequencies that are now all of the broadcast and shortwave bands. And when they listened carefully, this is what they heard. This early spark gap transmitter sent out a radio wave that a good receiver could hear as far as 200 miles away. It was with amateur equipment like this that our sophisticated communications industry got its start. And under the guidance of Hiram Percy Maxim, ham radio got itself organized in 1914 with the founding of the American Radio Relay League here in this house in Hartford, Connecticut. Today, with modern buildings and facilities in New England, Connecticut, the ARRL is still the focal point of organized amateur activities in the United States. Other countries have their own organizations. 
The Radio Society of Great Britain serves England's 20,000 plus amateurs from its headquarters in London, where the entire operation is fully computerized. In Tokyo, the Japan Amateur Radio League performs similar functions for the fast-growing ham population in Japan. But no matter where you go, the goal of amateur radio is always the same, communication. This amateur station near Phoenix belongs to a ham named Barry, United States Senator Barry Goldwater. Hello, uh, Mrs. Martineau. Uh -huh. This is an amateur radio station in Arizona. And uh, we have your husband, the captain, on the other end of this hookup. Uh -huh. I'd like to ask you, have you ever talked before by amateur radio? I have. Oh, you have. Well, that's wonderful. We're always glad to hear that. And you know the magic word over. Fine. Don't forget it. And the next voice that you hear will be that of Captain Martineau. Mm. AI-8 Alpha Hotel. This is AFA-7 UGA, ready to go. You're out of the And this here is the captain's voice. Hi, over there, and this is me. And uh, it's, uh, it's Thursday morning over here on the 27th. And uh, who am I talking to? Okay. You're talking to me, honey, and it sounds wonderful to hear your voice. We're just sitting here finishing dinner. and uh, It gives me a great deal of satisfaction every time I can make a phone patch like this. There's a technical achievement of being able to talk to the other side of the world, but more than that, it's using this ability to help someone stay in touch with family and friends. I love you so much. We're so lonesome. Over. I love you too, darling. Uh, have you got your little friends there? And how are they? Over. Here's Marsha. Hi, Dad. Over. Hi, Marsha. Some hands specialize in relaying messages from Little America. It's a service well appreciated because amateur radio is the only person-to-person -person link between the Antarctic crew and their families back home. For USX Little America, this is W6 Benny's Ed, Chairman Oaks, California. I have Mrs. Lyons on the line, and she's very anxious to hear her son's voice, and she has talked on a phone test before, so we're ready. Over. W6 Benny's Ed, this is uh, Casey for USX Little America. Very, very fine one, Art. You're coming through great down here today. is a real morale booster here and in hundreds of places around the globe. Quite an accomplishment for a bunch of volunteers. Sometimes you don't need to hear a familiar voice, but just get a message through. That's when hands rely on Morse code, still the most efficient way to communicate. Some amateurs, like Louise here, handle thousands of messages a year, all for other people. Radio teletype is another way hands communicate. David Evans, in his home just outside London, is talking to a friend in Middlesex using his amateur teletype. A person with a speech or hearing problem has no handicap here because with teletype, you let your fingers do the talking. Not that there's anything wrong with just talking. Lots of hands make lots of friends that way. I'm glad you have everything under control. And it's nice to know there's always someone there if you need help. April Mel is putting her hobby to work in the St. Jude Hospital Rehab Center. Uh, this is KL7. I heard, heard, and greet to ask him. The handle here is Harley, H-A-R-L-E-Y, like the motorcycle. Go ahead, April. Hey, Mel, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Just a little bit of trouble here. Uh, Mel, what's the matter? with some of our rehab patients, and uh, they're very eager to say hello to Alaska. So here's the first gentleman, Harley. Uh, Harley, hello, in uh, Anchorage, Alaska. And my name is uh, Paul Green, and uh, I'm from uh, uh, Laura Berlin. I never case. say, I could never say that. <laughs> Watch, watch me, and we'll do it together. Barbara, Barbara Linda. Linda. Very good. Uh, Paul's been undergoing some speech therapy, and this is the second time he's joined us for radio time. That's the super. Okay. There's no way you can feel isolated or alone when you're in a ham shack. And, uh, she has a little trouble getting out the words she likes. There are hams in virtually every country of the world. 
On a given day, you might talk to this station in France. Call sign, F8RU. Or CR9AJ in the Portuguese colony of Macau, a tiny peninsula off mainland China. Torres is the only ham here and a very popular fellow. Tuning the bands, it's very likely that you'll hear one of the half million or so stations in Japan, the country with more amateurs than any other in the world. Japanese ham stations are every bit as sophisticated as you'd expect them to be. There's a lot of activity at 4U1 ITU in Geneva, Switzerland. This well-known station at the International Telecommunication Union is often operated by visiting amateurs from other countries. And as a permanent record of memorable contact, hams exchange these QSL cards. Some hams have cards from more than 300 different countries. Here's a card from a ham in Virginia, K4LIB. His name is Arthur, Arthur Godfrey. The advancements in amateur radio in the last 10 w years really are amazing. WB3EUN, WB3EJG. Hi, Lynn. Matt and I are riding horseback. How'd you make out? They didn't have everything I wanted, but I got a few things, and uh, I got a really good... When you compare modern VHF radios oh, well, listen, to the old spark gap transmitters of yesteryear, you realize how far radio has come and how much hams have contributed to its improvement. With these miniaturized transceivers, many husband and wife amateurs find it easy to keep in touch no matter where they are. Did you ever wonder how parade coordinators keep their parades coordinated? Well, in parades all across the country, volunteer hams use portable radios to relay information from the parade route back to the officials, so decisions are made faster and the parades run more smoothly. And recently, the Rose Parade got a new service, amateur television, with video cameras and amateur transmitters the ham operators enable the parade officials to see firsthand the crucial areas of the route. If any float has trouble, like making a turn, for instance, the parade coordinators spot the problem on their monitor and know what kind of help is needed. Tom, your picture's beginning to come in now. Now, of course, hams have been experimenting with television since before yeah. television. No free. Great picture. Gail Hauk is about to be visited by the Tom O'Hara family 30 miles away via amateur television. Uh, something else I'd like to show you is Kelly's uh, new trophy she got for motorcycle racing. Okay, here's Kelly in the uh, trophy. It's almost as big as she is. Um, she got first place in her class. Well, that's fine, Kelly. Congratulations. That's a beautiful trophy. Hey, Dale, Ricky's uh, at the computer here, and he's getting to be quite a hot shot at uh, this target game where he's shooting down spaceships. Another rich and, source uh, of experimentation um, is the personal computer. These gadgets can do millions of things, including yeah. send and receive Morse yeah, kind of code at any speed you want. And uh, even balance my checkbook once in a while. With these miniaturized transceivers, your range increases as your altitude increases. Even with low power, communications are reliable for over 100 miles when you're well off the ground. Consequently, hams have repeaters, automatic relay stations, high atop buildings, mountains, television towers. These repeaters listen for signals and then retransmit them from their lofty perch. When relayed by a repeater, a small one-watt radio like this has the same range as much higher-powered units. I haven't talked to you in quite a while. If you want a repeater that really covers some territory, try putting it 500 miles up. This is Oscar 8, an amateur satellite, in its final testing stage.
There are two transponders on board. One of them was built by a group in Japan, the Japanese AMSAT group. One was built by the AMSAT group in Washington. The Germans built the battery charge regulators, and the Canadians built some of the control circuitry. And it's really an international effort. It takes a lot of work from a lot of people to complete a project like this. But it's worth it, because with amateur satellites, hams have reliable, long-range communications using small antenna and less power than an average light bulb. And when the first Oscar satellite was launched into orbit, it was another noteworthy success added to an already long list of amateur radio achievements. Juliet Bravo Kilo, this is Japan, Yokohama number one. Juliet Yankee one. Uh, I'm receiving you. Not only is amateur radio a hobby of vast technical diversity, it's an avocation which attracts people from every walk of life and level of society. Uh, my complete call sign is Juliet Yankee number one. Just the two letters and the one number. Uh, my handle is Hussein, hotel, uniform, Sierra, Sierra, Echo India November. And the QTH is just northwest of Amman, Alpha, Mike. This Mike, is King Hussein of Jordan, one of the best known amateur radio operators in the world. The ham with whom he's talking doesn't realize he's talking to a king, but most hams do know who belongs to the call sign JY1. Bye bye, and all the very best of seven feet. Delta Kilo to Oscar Charlie, DK to Oscar Charlie. Delta Kilo to Oscar Charlie, this is Japan, uh, Yankee 1, Juliet Yankee 1. Uh, good afternoon to you, my friend, 5 by 9, go. Okay, real fine, your majesty, your 5 and 9 likewise, into West Berlin. West Berlin is a location, and my name is Uli, United London, Italy. We we'll work here, sell my whiskey Alpha 3, Hotel United, Papa, and we're we'll running an ICOM 701, a solid killer, one linear amplifier behind, and the antenna is a PH60XX of about 225 feet. J11, DK2, Oscar Charlie. I think as you ask, Charlie, Roger, uh, my good friend, uh, thank you very much indeed. You have a very solid signal into uh, this QTS near Amman, the capital city of Jordan, 5-9 plus. And we're operating the Tango Romeo 7 transceiver by Drake and the L4B linear amplifier. And uh, my KSL manager is this Alpha 3 Honolulu United Pacific, and this is Hussein, wishing you all the very best of 7 feet. Okay, real fine, beautiful copy, your majesty. King Hussein not only enjoys ham radio personally, he has implemented creative uses of ham radio in his country's school. Japan, Yankee 5, Hotel, Hotel, Florida, calling CQ-15. CQ-15. These young ladies comprise this year's amateur radio class at the Al Hussein Secondary School for Girls. In addition to good operating practices, these students are taught Morse code and international regulations. With this modest station, both teachers and students enjoy communicating with other hands all over the world. This international communication not only polishes operating skills, but sharpens understanding of foreign customs and lifestyles. I believe that uh, as far as amateur radio is concerned, it's, it's a way of uh, bringing people together uh, throughout the world. It's uh, an interest that um, enhances the creativity of young people and uh, their knowledge of uh, electronics. It creates uh, tremendous opportunities in so many fields and so many areas. It's somehow appropriate that here, in Jordan, one of the first areas of the Earth inhabited by intelligent man, a creative use of amateur radio is helping develop this nation's scientific community. But ham radio is more than a worldwide reservoir of technical talent. It's fun, and often hands get together in person. For example, at a convention in San Diego, sponsored by the American Radio Relay League. It's a chance to see all the latest equipment, hear speakers on a variety of topics. 
and have eyeball contacts with friends you've made on the air. One of the most enjoyable activities in the ham year is field day. It's a sort of 24-hour operating marathon organized by the American Radio Relay League. The major feature of field day is that every ham station participating in the contest is using emergency type power, batteries, generators, solar cells, you name it. The key to putting out a big signal is a good antenna. This field day operation running less than 10 watts was the top winner in a recent competition. It's lots of fun to see how many other stations you can contact. But the big benefit is emergency preparedness. With field day, every ham in the country can practice his skill under simulated emergency conditions. When the ground gave way at Laguna Beach, California, dozens of homes were damaged or destroyed. With the phone lines down, two-way radio was the only way to get messages into and out of the disaster area. Dozens of amateurs took off work to help their neighbors. They used their repeater's auto patch, an automated telephone patching system, to let victims reassure worried relatives that they were okay. The hams also relayed thousands of messages for the Red Cross and other groups aiding the victims. Sometimes hams become heroes and make headlines. The story of WD6FFV was front page news and the subject of television news reports. This morning, 13-year-old Californian Mike Davis saved the lives of three persons aboard a sinking boat in the Caribbean. He did it by relaying the boat's distress signal to the Coast Guard on his amateur radio. The teenager was listening to his radio at 1 o'clock this morning when he heard the signal for help from the boat. For as yet unexplained reasons, the Coast Guard did not pick up the distress call in Miami but it was heard here by Mike more than 3,000 miles away. So he took control and relayed messages to officials for over an hour. And because communications were established, the Coast Guard in Miami was able to track down the sinking boat and all aboard were rescued. Mike, at any time while you were talking with the sinking boat, were you worried that uh, you weren't doing the right thing? Uh, not really. I didn't have really much time to do things like that. Neighbors had recently called Mike's antennas unsightly. After this morning's rescue, Mike's mother says the antennas will stay. Mike Davis, ham radio hero. Hams often supply communications during disasters and are especially effective in rugged territory such as this in a near wilderness area southeast of San Francisco. Firefighters are making slow headway against a devastating forest fire. With stations at all fire camps, Volunteer amateurs provide supplemental communication for the firefighting organization. We're going to have more activity in the Carmel Valley, and we need the coverage. Well, we, I agree with that. I agree with that, but that's the only thing that's getting in there. We've got some other problems down there. We have used uh, the ham operators the most as the camps are getting organized. And uh, until the ground lines can be established, we've needed uh, the ham operators to help us get information back and forth. Also, these people have the capabilities of, uh, of uh, allowing the firefighters to talk home. The Army sergeant with the unit here came in uh, with, uh, with ten messages, all of the same text, to ten different people, of course. Uh, each one will accept a direct collect call. So I suggest that we give you, first of all, the text of the message. Uh, will that be okay? Okay? Yeah, that's Roger. Go ahead. Okay, the text of the message to each of the recipients will be, am alive and well, hope to be released within the next few days. Uh, break for check. Still writing. Am I? Am alive and well, hope to be released in the next few days. Uh, Roger, on that. The Marble Cone Fire was finally brought under control after two weeks of battle thanks to the 24-hour efforts of hundreds of firefighters and scores of volunteer amateur radio operators. Everybody got minus 50 degrees and nobody believed it, right? Here's a ham doing a different kind of volunteering. You don't even believe those magic little pins you've got there that copy the Morse code better than most of us, right? Stu Gillum, okay, actor, comedian, and today, also a ham volunteer instructor at Murphy's radio class. Did everybody get that? All the people nodding their head got that, right? And the people looking mystified didn't. No. <laughs> I got it. Okay. 
This is a class of hams who want to get their amateur extra license, the top of the line. But most of them started here. This is the class for people who don't know a thing about radio, but they want to get in on the action. And in just a couple of months, these folks will be able to get their first ham license and get on the air. It's not that hard, especially the novice test. David, uh, what is Ohm's Law? What is Erie. Yeah, Ohm's Law is Erie, which is what? E equals IR. IR. Okay, that's fine. Ham radio is especially uh, beneficial to the handicapped. And there are classes and ham clubs all over the country that offer help in getting started. And a good ham station doesn't have to take up the whole house either. This novice put his gear in his bedroom. It cost him about, oh, $300. Oh, hey, you can spend more than that. But you don't have to mortgage the house or hop your mother-in-law to get started. Oh, one thing you can count on, once you get started, You'll be hooked. I am, that's for sure. W6HQ, W Delta 6 FDU. WD6 FDU, this is W6AQ. Well, there you have it, the world of amateur radio. Most of all, it's people communicating with people. And in our future as hands, we dream of the day when members of our fraternity will be orbiting the Earth in space stations or inhabiting colonies on the moon or Mars. We see in the near future handheld radios like this linked to satellites that will give us worldwide person-to-person -person capabilities. But most of all, in the here and now, our hobby gives us the world, a world of learning and helping others and just plain having fun. Is uh, this frequency clear? This is W6RO. <laughs> Dick Van Dyke was a really good sport and a lot of fun. Too bad he's not a ham. Of course, it's never too late now that the code requirement is, uh, you know, out the window. Don't get me started. At least Dick Van Dyke wouldn't be an example of dumbing down the hobby. Oh, I hate that phrase. I don't know about you, but almost everything I learned about ham radio, I learned after I got my ticket. The appearance of King Hussein, JY1, deserves special mention. We'd heard he was interested in being in the film, but the Middle East was blowing up, so it wasn't a surprise that we couldn't get a confirmation from the palace. What to do? We were basically finished editing the film, and it was all ready to go to the lab when word came that His Majesty would participate. But by then, the budget was all gone. There was no more money. No problem, said Hussein's communications advisor, a ham, incidentally, like virtually everybody else on Hussein's staff. His Majesty would get me to Jordan and put me up while I was there. In other words, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. It helped, I suspect, that he owned the airline. His Majesty assigned Mohammed Balbizi, JY4MB, to be my guide. What a great guy. Whenever we went into a restaurant, we never saw a check. Who paid? That trip turned out to be one of the major highlights of my amateur radio career, no doubt about it. I could make a speech about it. In fact, I have, several times. Also, I personally find it very comforting to realize that the ham station on the Queen Mary is still there, making contacts and proving to thousands of visitors every year that ham radio has not been replaced by the Internet or anything else. And I need to note that two of the great YLs of ham radio, Lenore Jensen, W6NAZ, and Louise Moreau, WB6BBO Portable 3, appeared in the same film together. Nobody handled a microphone better than Lenore, and nobody made a bug sing like Louise. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I don't have to send WB6BBO slash bar 3 on a bug. One of the reasons I changed my call from W6BVN was that I didn't like the 6 and the B next to each other. 
Of course, if you don't know the code, you don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, believe me, W6AQ is a whole lot easier to send and receive. Watching the world of amateur radio again after all these years brought back a lot of happy memories for me. I hope you enjoyed it half as much as I did. Thanks for watching.